About a few years after video games started gaining traction on YouTube, the retro collecting scene exploded, much to the chagrin of collectors have been doing it since I was a little tickle in my pappy sack, cause when the demand for something skyrockets while well, the supply is only decreasing more and more with each passing year, the prices tend to get a little bit more frigged over time, and while it was still fun going to thrift stores and flea markets for a few more years, most of the resellers, thrifters, or whatever you want to call them started catching on to how expensive games were becoming, making it impossible to find anything at a reasonable price just about anywhere, thus killing the hobby for anyone who's not a multi-billionaire. And with there being so many other ways to play retro games these days that have a lot of advantages outside of saving literally thousands of dollars, I kinda sold big parts of my collection off, which is something I would've never imagined doing just a few years ago, especially since most of what I sold are some of my all-time favorite games. However, despite the fact that I've sold most of my collection off to pay my long overdue egg bills, there are still quite a few consoles that are worth collecting in my opinion, whether it be because they're cheap, have great games that you can't play anywhere else, have features that can't be properly duplicated through emulation without watering the experience down, or a combination of all the above. So if you're thinking about collecting some video games but aren't quite sure where to start, then make sure to pour yourself a glass of powdered water, press the subscribe button if you haven't already, and allow me, the world's smelliest wiffle ball player, Cameron All One Word, to tell you the 11 best retro consoles to collect for. But before I begin, let me reiterate that this is not a list of my all-time favorite consoles, just the ones that I think are the best to collect for for various reasons that I'm gonna get into along the way. So without further ado, let's truck along with... Number 11. The GameCube. I remember laughing at a friend of mine who bought a brand new GameCube for a hundred bucks after the Wii was already out, but nowadays I'm kicking myself in the Peter for not doing the exact same thing, even though I still got my original console, which is the first one I ever bought with my own money, by the way. Right before a price cut, mind you, but I still think it'd be pretty cool to have my own backup GameCube, because as far as actual games are concerned, the GameCube is one of my all-time favorite consoles, period. Sure, pretty much the entire library could be ported over to modern consoles without losing a whole lot, outside of a few rare occasions where the sensitive spring triggers are actually used. In fact, it honestly surprised me if all the best GameCube games weren't given HD remasters at some point, which is why the console barely even made the list at all. But the fact is that as of this recording, most of the GameCube's library stuck on this console, and even though most of the best games are pretty expensive these days, I still think it's a pretty fun console to collect for, partially because of the awesome game library, but also due to the wide variety of colorways for the consoles and controllers, which is going to be a recurring theme in this video, as well as the Game Boy player that lets you play Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games on your TV, not to mention the handful of games that actually interact with certain Game Boy Advance titles that'll definitely be lost in inevitable HD remasters. As soon as Nintendo makes an easily hackable GameCube Classic Edition, or at least ports all the best games over to the Switch or whatever its successor ends up being, this console is probably going to lose its place in this list, but until then, I think I'm going to hang on to my GameCube collection. Number 10. The PlayStation 2. To a lot of people, the PlayStation 2 is probably the best console to collect for, given that there's over 3,800 games that are mostly dirt cheap, not to mention the library of over 3,000 PS1 games that the console could play as well. But seeing as how a lot of the best titles were given HD remasters that are just plain better, I had to put this relatively low on the list, but if you're a stickler for playing games on the original hardware and don't mind buying composite cables to avoid using a tube TV, then the PlayStation 2 is probably the most collectible console with the best balance between quantity and quality at a low cost, and it's also probably the only console left in the world where you can still go to thrift stores and flea markets and probably find a decent and haul if you're looking for it. Especially since, again, it's backwards compatible with the PS1, which I don't really find to be all that collectible in and of itself. I mean, the PS1 Mini might have been a little disappointing, but for games that aren't Ape Escape, it's really not that bad if you hack it. But now I'm getting a tad off topic, I suppose. If you're going for completion and don't have a billion dollars to spare, then the PS2 is probably the worst console to collect for, but if you're like females in Cindy Lauper's universe and just want to have fun, then the PS2's for you. Number 9. The Wii U. Alright, so I know that most of the Wii U's best games have already gotten enhanced ports on the Switch, and it probably won't be very long before the rest of the library comes over as well, which is why the Wii U's still pretty low on this list. But you know what, that doesn't mean it's not worth owning one, because the best time to collect for a console is when people laugh at the idea, and the sweet spot's usually right after a console dies. And even beyond all the games that'll work just fine on the Switch, there were still quite a few titles that actually did utilize the gamepad to create a completely unique experience, like Kirby and the Rainbow Curse, Game and Wario, and the incredibly underrated Nintendo Land that I honestly love, and to this day, I still want to get together with people and actually play it at least one time. Thankfully, I've still got the game and console to make my dreams come true, since Nintendo's probably never gonna release it again, so now all I need are some friends, because whenever my neighbor Terry comes over, he'd rather just play games with my wife in our bedroom, and for whatever reason, I'm not allowed to know which ones. <laughs> whatever games they are playing, though, I'm sure they're probably crazy, because Terry could be quite the rap scallion. but I can tell you right now that regardless of what games they may or may not be playing, it's probably not as fun as playing the Wii U, or even the regular Wii, which the console is also backwards compatible with. And obviously, that only gives you all the more reason to own one. Number 8. The Nintendo 69. 69. <laughs> Alright, so I sold all my NES and Super Nintendo games off, because honestly, I just find the Classic Edition consoles to be the perfect middle ground for being convenient to play without feeling bootleg. 
I mean, they're officially licensed consoles that look really cool, but thanks to illegally adding ROMs, some of which can't even officially be bought anymore, I can use these things to play my favorite games with authentic first-party controllers made by Nintendo on my HDTV with save states so I don't gotta write passwords out like a jabroni, and even though Nintendo's probably not gonna make a 64 Mini anytime soon, I think it's pretty obvious that they inevitably will someday, and since I believe that, you might not think that I consider the 64 to be a very good console to collect for, but unlike the NES and Super Nintendo, the 64 has got a wide variety of awesome colorways for controllers and the consoles themselves, and hopefully I'm wrong, but I just don't think Nintendo's gonna make classic editions and controllers for every last colorway that they originally did. And honestly, I wouldn't hold my breath over Hori doing the exact same thing with their collectible controllers either. Sadly, 64 games are sold in these crappy little cardboard boxes, and to make matters worse, the cartridges don't even have friggin' end labels for whatever reason, but even beyond all the really cool colorways, the file sizes for 64 games were considerably larger than the NES and Super Nintendo, meaning that if you hack a 64 Mini, you're probably gonna have to pick and choose which games make the cut if you don't want this bootleg-ass thumb drive sticking out of one of your controller ports, which isn't really too big of a deal, I suppose, since the 64 didn't really have that many games in its library that are worth playing these days, but it's still enough of a hassle to where I'm just not ready to part ways with my 64 collection just yet. At least not until that dang egg guy Ricky threatens to fracture my ass again for missing a payment. And if you're watching this video right now, don't worry, the money's coming. Number 7. The PS Vita. With Persona 4 Golden popping up on Steam, one of the biggest reasons to own a Vita kinda flew out the window, and it probably won't be very long till the game pops up on the Switch, so it's not even like the Vita is gonna be the only way to play the game portably. But even so, there's still so much to love about what could be Sony's final dedicated handheld that makes it really fun to collect for. I mean, aside from Persona 4 Golden, which is always gonna be great to play on the Vita regardless, there's also assloads of other great PS Vita games, as well as classic PS1 and PSP titles that you could download for pretty cheap, at least compared to eBay prices anyway. And as an added bonus, you could also pair it with your PS3, 4, and hopefully 5 for remote play if you're a Wii U type of person. But even beyond all that, there's also plenty of fun colorways as well, and honestly, I really love the packaging for Vita games, probably more so than any other console in history, because it's just perfect for collecting. Sadly, there are a few games that are gonna be useless someday due to the fact that they require downloads to be playable, but fortunately, I only know of a handful of games where this is an issue, so it's no poop off my butt. Number 6. The Game Boy Advance. True, you don't really need to collect Game Boy Advance games, seeing as uh, emulator's been playing these games perfectly for over a decade now, but for whatever reason, collecting for handhelds is considerably cheaper than home consoles, even though the games are oftentimes just as good, especially with a Game Boy Advance that was more or less a portable Super Nintendo, and just like many of the other consoles in this video, the Game Boy Advance has got plenty of neat colorways to choose from, but the big problem with that is that the standard model doesn't have a front or backlit screen, meaning that playing games in the dark's damn near impossible, and while this issue was fixed with the Game Boy Advance SP, especially with the 101 models, Nintendo forgot to give the thing a headphone jack for whatever reason, which might not bother most people, but eh, I, I kinda think it's essential. Nintendo did eventually make the Game Boy Micro that still had a bright screen and a headphone jack, but for some reason, this model lost backwards compatibility with Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, which definitely loses some points as far as collectability is concerned. And given how small the screen is, playing any kind of games with a lot of text kind of sucks, so sadly, there isn't really one definitive Game Boy Advance model, but seeing as how nobody really thinks about this handheld as often as they should, that kind of makes it easy to build a respectable game library up, and even though it does kind of suck that the retail boxes were all made of cardboard, the tiny cartridges did at least make it kind of fun to dig around and try and find the game you want to play but I do still wish that Nintendo had an official dust case like they did with the original Game Boy, though. Speaking of the original Game Boy... Number 5. The Game Boy and Game Boy Color, they're both the same thing, friggit. Much like the Game Boy Advance, collecting for the Game Boy and Game Boy Color are pretty cheap outside of a few games, mainly because it has the perception of being a watered-down NES slash Super Nintendo, which is definitely true for games that were just lazily copy and pasted over from those consoles, but there's still plenty of really good original games that usually get overlooked, which might kinda suck for the developers who put so much time into making these games, but it is still great for modest collectors who don't feel like spending their life savings just to play 30-year-old games on official hardware. Outside all the standard games that could be easily emulated, though, there are quite a few gimmicks that emulation's just never gonna get quite right, like the Game Boy Camera, which looks absolutely terrible, sure, but at the same time, that's kinda why it's so awesome. And even more so than any other console on this list, the amount of colorways for all the Game Boy lines kinda makes collecting the actual hardware a separate hobby in and of itself. Much like most of the other handhelds in this video, the lack of a region log means that you'll not only have more options for your perfect Game Boy, but also that if a game's too expensive in one region, then you can simply just buy it from another, and since most regular Game Boy and Game Boy Color games don't really have all that much text in them in the first place, it shouldn't really make a difference for you, although I do wish I could play more Detective Conan games aside from that fan-translated bootleg cartridge that I paid way too much money for at a convention. Number 4. The Wii. 
Sure, Super Mario Galaxy plays just fine on the 3D All-Stars compilation for the Nintendo Switch, but even so, I still think it was glaring proof that Wii games are always going to be best played on the original hardware, mainly due to the fact that, in my opinion, pointer controls are far better and more accurate than gyro controls, even though sensor bars are kind of a hassle. Sure, a big chunk of the Wii's library would definitely be better on modern consoles, or at the very least as good, but even though the console had plenty of shovelware titles that gave the Wii Remote and Nunchuck a bad reputation, the fact is that the Wii had over 1,500 games, and even though the majority of them might not have been anything special, there were still plenty that really made the most out of the controller scheme, like the assloads of on-rail shooters, and even some of the wacky gimmick games that were actually pretty fun sometimes. Sadly, the above-average size dead never delivered as many colorways as they initially implied they would at the E3 where the Wii was first revealed, but there's still plenty of great games that you could find for dirt cheap, whether they be popular ones that everyone knows about, or the overlooked ones that never got a chance to shine in the first place, and seeing how the Wii Remote and Nunchuck will probably never feel quite the same on Joy-Cons or anything else, I think that the Wii's gonna be worth holding onto for the foreseeable future, or even getting into for that matter, and, you know, it could also play GameCube games too, so, you know, there is that. Number 3. The Dreamcast. Even though Sega recently hinted that they're gonna make a Dreamcast Mini, I already made an entire video about why I don't really want one all that bad, and most of it has to do with the fact that I just don't trust that everything that made the Dreamcast great is gonna translate into a mini console. I mean, obviously the majority of games are gonna play just fine on a classic console, but is Sega really gonna make a keyboard just so we could play one of my all-time favorite games, Typing of the Dead? Are they gonna make VMU memory cards that come with all the original mini games that could be played independently from the Dreamcast? Is there gonna be a microphone for C-Man? What about an arcade pad for all the fighting games, which is one of the best parts about the Dreamcast? Well, to be fair, there would probably be an arcade pad of some kind, but other than that, I seriously doubt Sega's gonna go above and beyond, which is why I stand by everything I said in my Dreamcast Mini video, and again, I'm not saying that I don't want a Dreamcast Mini per se, I'm just saying that unless it's done correctly, it'll never be enough of a reason for me to sell my entire Dreamcast collection off, especially since it has the definitive versions for a lot of my favorite PS1 games, including Resident Evil 2, which I actually did sell at one point and then immediately regretted, so I cancelled the order and got negative feedback. But let me tell ya, I think it was well worth it. Numbers 1 and 2. The Nintendo Dual Screen and 3 Dual Screen. The reason why I'm lumping these two handhelds together is because I'm pretty much going to say the same thing about both of them, which would be that due to the touch controls, dual screens, microphone, and in the 3DS's case, Street Pass and 3D that no one's ever going to use, emulation's just never going to be quite right for either of these two platforms if the games ever get remastered at some point, which we've already seen for the few that have. Plus, with the 3DS having died just recently, now's the perfect time to either build your collection or even start it from scratch, because while some games might be getting a little expensive these days, the majority of the 3,000 games that these handhelds have to offer are still pretty cheap, not to mention all the cool colorway options you have, especially if you got a new 3DS not XL with interchangeable faceplates. I would say you should just get a 3DS and not even bother with an original DS model, since the 3DS is backwards compatible, but with regular DSs being so ungodly cheap, it's probably worth getting one of those as well, seeing as how DS games do look an ass hair better on the original hardware, and also because they're backwards compatible with Game Boy Advance games, with some DS titles even taking advantage of the Game Boy Advance cartridge slot, mainly with the Pokemon games. And look, I know some people are going to try claiming that DS and 3DS emulators on their phones work just fine, but don't listen to this poppycock, because sure, emulators are obviously cheaper, being that they're free and all that, but despite the fact that I'd never shame anybody for using an emulator, I still think that using genuine hardware for these two software libraries is and always will be the best way to play these games, and seeing how the DS and 3DS are my two favorite software libraries of all time, that makes these the two absolute best platforms to collect for in my opinion, which is why I'm never ever gonna sell them, even if I'm about to be evicted and lose all my eggs. But anyway, that's my list. I can't stress enough that every collector's got their own specific goals, so I'm sure there's not going to be too many people who completely agree with this video, but just keep in mind that my personal goals aren't necessarily just the quality of games, but rather how much they cost, how many games had massive day one downloads that aren't always going to be available, how much of a hassle they are to play on modern TVs since I personally find CTRs to be a bit much, and how many features the original consoles had that'd be lost in converting them to modern systems. With well, that being said though, let me know what you think of my choices in the comments below, let me know what consoles you collect for if any at all, and as always, I'll try my goddamnedest to respond to everybody at some point. But, uh, let me tell you, if there's two people who I'd certainly collect for if there were gaming consoles, then it would definitely be today's Patrons of the Day, Michael D and NPC Villager. If you want to be badasses like these two, then consider supporting FU Game Crew on Patreon for loot boxes and silly rewards in the mail, send pictures or videos if you rocking merch if you want to make cameos in my videos, and follow me on Twitch if you ever want to hang out whenever I play video games sometimes. My name's Cameron All One Word, and I'll see you next time. So I want to say thank you to your loyalty, thank you for your support.